Good morning. morning. And welcome to worship this morning. And especially warm welcome if you were here for the first time, either in person or online. And we invite you to join any of the activities uh, of the congregation. Um, Reminder, exit in the back and an exit to my right here in the front. Some special announcements remind you we are going to help to resettle a Ukrainian family and the sign-up sheet is uh, online each Thursday morning of the things we are going to need. Still no time or date uh, or um, information on the size of the family yet. Um, Next Sunday after worship uh, we'll be having a meeting um, to talk about and think about the Shrove Tuesday dinner. That's been a tradition for many years but a whole number of people who are, have, of the adults that make the kitchen happen uh, for health or other reasons are no longer able to help. So we're gonna sit, talk about the feasibility of that uh, next Sunday after worship. Um, Once again, uh, we're going to be having a virtual wine tasting to benefit Hearts and Hands, and it's going to be Friday, February 10th at 7 p.m. This year, we're going to be featuring a tour of Italy wines. Okay, so it's going to be good. Um, And you can sign up in the Staying Connected. When you go to register, all the information for the wine tasting is there, the Zoom link, and how you pick up the wine and where and when. So it's a lot of fun and also informative. Um, So sign up today before the Bills game. Bills. (laughs) And again, that helps support Hearts and Hands, one of our mission projects. Also, February 12th, Super Bowl Sunday, uh, at 1.30 to 2.30, plenty of time, won't interfere, we'll prepare you Uh, for the Super Bowl, Uh, Buffalo String Works will be doing a concert here and it'll be a free will offering for their work which is bringing music to people who don't have the opportunity, uh, youth who do not have the opportunity for music in Buffalo. They're up to something like serving 160 kids in the program and that's doubled in the last year. So please come at 1.30. Bob Podzik's um, program on the treasures of the Vatican that had to be canceled because of weather in November is now scheduled for the last uh, Saturday of uh, February at Amherst Church at 9 o'clock, and we have a sign-up sheet for that as well. Anything else we need to be reminded of? If not, let us prepare our hearts for worship. soul waits in silence. Spread love for us the Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Our first hymn is number 31, Let Us with a Gladsome Mind.
let us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We come before God, not as despised sinners, but as beloved children. With the confidence of the children of God, let us humbly confess our sin. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desire, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength, through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. disappoint us, for God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us in baptism. Believe this good news and give thanks. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.
Let us pray. Eternal God, as we listen to this reading of scripture, open our ears that we may hear your word, open our minds that we may understand your word, open our hearts that we may live your word. The Old Testament lesson is found in Deuteronomy, book 5, verses 1 through 11. It's found in your pew Bible on page 156. Moses convened all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances that I am addressing to you today. You shall learn them and observe them diligently. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. Not with our ancestors did the Lord make this covenant, but with us who are all of us here alive today. The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain out of the fire. At that time, I was standing between the Lord and you to declare to you the words of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire and did not go up to the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. The psalm today is Psalm 128, found in your pew Bible on page 541, or it's in your bulletin. This will be read responsively. Happy is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. be seated. Our New Testament lesson comes from Matthew's Gospel, the seventh chapter. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? and do many deeds in your power, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Here ends the lesson. Our text comes from that lesson. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Let us pray. 
eternal God, bless us this day with your presence, that as we ponder the meaning of these words, we might be led into your truth. In your name we pray. Amen. Many, uh, when, when we were children, we learned to recite many things by heart. In school, and they still do it, obviously, they learn the Pledge of Allegiance. In Scouts, we may have learned the oath. We've all learned to sing the National Anthem. At home and in church, we learn to say certain prayers from memory. As adults repeating these familiar words, we often receive comfort from the experience of the familiar. The rituals become affirming in our common life. But the routine repetition of these formulas can blind us to what they're actually saying. My family had a prayer, a set prayer before meals when I was growing up. It was the simple grace, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. Amen. After having dinner at my parents' house for the first time, Kathleen had no idea what words had been prayed before the meal. We said the words together so fast like an auctioneer such rapidity that she couldn't even make out one word. Maybe the amen, but that's it. And there are times when we sh are the same with the Lord's Prayer. We can recite them all so quickly that we lose their meaning. If we focus on the actual words, we can be sometimes surprised at their meaning. Many people recite these words every day. These words have given people comfort in every circumstance of life. But that constant repetition can make us unaware of the, some of the radical elements in this prayer. And that's the case with our words, Our Father who art in heaven. These familiar and often comforting words are in reality some of the most radical in the whole Bible. In these words, Jesus calls for a reordering of our commitments. Cyprian, who was the bishop of Carthage and died in 258 AD, comments on this section of the Lord's Prayer in these somewhat complicated words. So you're going to have to, you're not going to get it all, but concentrate as best you can. After this manner, he says, pray you, our Father who art in heaven. The new man, born again and restored to his God by his grace, says, Father, in the first place, because he has now begun to be a son. The power to become sons of God, even to them that believed in his name, the person, therefore, who has believed in his name and has become God's son, ought, from this point, to begin both to give thanks and to profess himself God's son by declaring that God is his Father in heaven, and also to bear witness among the very first words of his new birth, that he has renounced an earthly and carnal father and that he has begun to know as well to, has a, to have as a father him only who is in heaven. As it is written, they say unto their father and their mother, I have no need and who have not acknowledged their own children. These have observed thy precepts and kept thy covenant. Also, the Lord in his gospel has bidden us to call no man our father upon earth because there is to be one father who is in heaven, unquote. Tough passage, but doesn't Cyprian sound harsh in the way he tells us that our loyalty is to God as father and not our earthly father? Cyprian is reminding us that the Lord's prayer is teaching us to reorder our loyalties. In the Roman world in which this was written, one's primary loyalty was to the family, and the family was led by the paterfamilias, the Latin word father of the family. The paterfamilias had great power given by law and tradition. He had a legal control of property at varying levels of authority over his wife, the children, and other relatives. During some periods of Roman history, the head of the family had the power of life and death. It was required by law at some points that their paterfamilias would ensure that 
non-perfect infants would be put to death. He had the duty as to, to father and raise healthy children as future citizens of Rome. He was held responsible for the moral behavior of the members of his household. He was expected to take economic care of those under his protection. He served priestly duties in the household serving the gods. And in return for that care and protection given by their paterfamilias, the members of the family owed obedience, respect, and loyalty. Each person's future was invested in the ability of that paterfamilias. But Jesus tells us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. And in these words, Jesus reminds us that our ultimate loyalty is not to an earthly paterfamilias, but rather to our heavenly Father. For Jesus, faith in God is not as much about belief as it is love and loyalty. Jesus calls on us to give our hearts to God. Now, one can only imagine how radical Jesus' words were to people living in the Roman Empire and in Roman families. Jesus was telling them that their primary identity was not to be found in their family. Their first commitment was not to the father of the family, but rather to the father in heaven, God. This is reflected, remember in that strange incident where Jesus' family comes to see him and he says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, here is my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. In cultures where family is the central fact of identity and loyalty, can you think of a more shocking set of statements? Jesus is telling them to understand their whole being in a new way. He asks them to reorient their entire understanding of life. He calls them to serve God first and not family. And so in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus calls us to a new loyalty. In so many places of the New Testament, there are calls to place our primary trust and loyalty in God. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Whoever is not with me is against me. And we could go on and on quoting New Testament passages that illustrate the same point. And in the Magnificat, Mary proclaims that Jesus, in Jesus, God is turning the world upside down. God is calling us to give our allegiance to God. And the truth is, in almost every culture, Christians have been suspect. In the Roman Empire, there were many different religions. And when the Romans conquered a new territory, they didn't force the people to follow, uh, to abandon their religion and follow Rome. Most of these new countries had pantheons of gods. And what the Romans asked was that these new parts of the empire just added, would just add Caesar to the list of gods that they would worship. What it could it hurt several times a year to make a sacrifice to Caesar? And most countries and peoples went along. It was those monotheistic Jews and Christians who refused. They just wouldn't cooperate. They didn't want to put up a statue of Augustus or make a sacrifice to him. And this led to riots in Jerusalem and other Jewish and Christian enclaves around the Roman Empire. Christians were often persecuted for one reason. They would not take part in worshiping the emperor. The Romans saw this as a lack of patriotism, while the Christians understood it to be idolatry. Polycarp was born in 69 AD and became one of the early followers of the new Christian movement. His leadership qualities were recognized by his fellow believers and was made the Bishop of Smyrna. But then in the year 155, the Roman authorities began to put pressure on Christians to show proper respect for the state. The elderly Polycarp was dragged before authorities and ordered to burn incense to the Roman emperor. 
he refused in these words. Eighty and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my King and Savior? Bring forth what thou wilt. Well, the Roman authorities burned him at the stake, and when the flames did not kill him, they stabbed him to death. Even Christian rulers have trouble with those whose primary allegiance is to God. One of Henry VIII's most trusted advisor was Thomas More, but when Henry went ahead with his divorce from the Catherine of Aragon without permission from Rome, Thomas was in a bind. His king demanded obedience, while his conscience told him to obey the ruling of the church. When Thomas More prayed, Our Father who art in heaven, he knew his primary allegiance was to God and not his king. His refusal to consider Henry the head of the Church of England led to losing his head. Now, what does this all mean for you and me? Isn't this ancient history? We don't have a strong hierarchical family structure like the Romans. We do not obe owe obedience to a paterfamilias. Yet, we all have a variety of voices calling us to supreme commitment. There are many peoples, activities, uh, and ideologies that seek our ultimate allegiance. For some, it still is family. There are people who value family connections and activities as being more important than any other value. Families demand money, time, and allegiance. There are some people whose entire lives are determined by the expectations placed on them by their parents. For some, even long after the parents have died, they're still following their dictates. For others, it can be work. In American culture, in the past, especially for men, identities were bound up in our careers. We are valued in our society often by how much money or power we can accumulate. Many of us can believe there's nothing more important than getting ahead. We will take that promotion no matter what it means for our families. And just think of the hours spent at work today. You know, there was a time, and it's not that long ago, when calendars were published for use at work and with hours starting at 9 and ending at 5. Today, there's no seeming division between work and private life. Technology has blurred the lines between work and home. People work at all hours, and even on, ver on vacation, various portable devices make it possible to put in a little work even while you're sitting on the beach. For people with children, sports can become all-consuming. The number of sports programs for young people has expanded exponentially, but it's not only the number that has expanded, but the length of the season for each sport has seemingly stretched out almost to the entire year. And so if you're a family with two or three children, each playing a couple of sports, it becomes increasingly difficult to do anything else but those sports and school. It's hard to go to worship or go on a mission trip or take a family vacation without some coach being upset. The attitude is, when you join the team, there is no higher loyalty. For others, the highest loyalty is to themselves. In the Old Testament, we read of people worshiping false gods. In our time, we have people who believe they are God. By that I mean, they believe that each person is to be the measure of all things. They believe it is their happiness and what makes them feel good to be the most important thing in life. They will not let any value or any person stand in the way of what they desire. Just watch a few hours of a reality show to understand that dynamic. You know, the housewives of whatever city demonstrating put, putting self first. But Christians are called to put God first. When Jesus teaches us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, he calls on us to renounce anything that claims first place in our lives. It means we are saying that we seek to put God first in all things. 
we want to allow God to shape, direct, and mold the rest of our lives. You and I may not be usually aware of it, but the Lord's Prayer begins with radical words in which we are called to give our trust to the one who made and redeemed us. They are a promise of commitment of our lives to God. They are almost creedal in nature. Several years ago, a young man named Roy Costner was the valedictorian of his high school class in South Carolina. When he was called to the podium, he ripped up the approved speech and said, those that we look up to are those who have helped carve and mold us into the young adults that we are today. I am glad that both of my parents led me to the Lord at a young age, he said, and I think most of you will understand when I say, and the rest of his speech was reciting the Lord's Prayer. Now, we may agree or disagree on the appropriateness of his actions at a secular graduation, but Roy was correct in understanding that the words, Our Father who art in heaven, are an affirmation of faith. In these words, we promise to put God first in our lives. So, each time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we affirm the radical nature of our commitment to the God who loves us. We again and again and again commit our lives into his care. We are responding to Jesus' call to follow him. Let us pray. <clears throat> Loving God, help us to put our trust evermore in you. Amidst all the various demands made on our attention and our loyalty, help us again to affirm our commitment to you in the words, Our Father, who art in heaven. Let us stand and sing hymn 721, Lord, you have come to the lakeshore.
join in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Eternal God, <clears throat> O God of grace, we pray for the church this day. Teach us to be one body in Christ, with all our members working together and striving for the greater gift of love. And we pray for the world. Bring good news, release, and freedom to the poor, the captives, and oppressed. Give new hope and vision in all those places of the world where there is no peace, bring peace. We pray for this community. Lead us by the wisdom of your word to go forth in mission to our neighbors, feeding the hungry with the bread of life. And we pray for loved ones this day. Give us gifts of healing and compassion to help those who are hurting to bring comfort to those who suffer, to be with those who mourn and need your presence. Mighty God, strengthen your people so that we may live in the world as those who you have chosen and called. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us receive our morning offering.
now go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.